Hey, welcome to Bridge Online. My name is Bethany. And I'm Paul, and we are so glad that you're here. We'd love to know where you're tuning in from today, so let us know in the chat. That's right. Whether you're a regular here or this is your first time, you made a great decision to tune in today. We are a church that exists to see people be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Yeah, and as we dive into a time of God's word today, we pray that it's a blessing to you and encourages us all to abide with and be transformed by Christ today and every day. And if it's your first time, we also are so glad that you're here. Would you let us know that you're here by doing one quick thing? Drop in a waving emoji in the chat and one of our online hosts would love to say hey. And if you're not joining us for the first time, can you help me welcome everyone who is by giving them a big bridge welcome in the chat? Then after you do, take a moment to share this stream with your family, your friends, because you never know who needs to hear this message today. All right, it's time to get started. As we head into the time of worship together, I'd encourage you to make your living room, your bedroom, your office, your dorm room, wherever you're at, a sanctuary where you can be fully present with God this morning. Set aside any distractions, get out a copy of God's Word, and maybe even a pen and a notebook so you can take notes as we go. That's right. Remember, we're not doing this alone. So at any time, let us know in the chat when something is encouraging you or stands out to you, because we're here to do this together and be on the journey of being with and becoming like Jesus. So on that note, let's dive into worship.
witness to him the struggles you carry or oh, bring them to Christ his yoke is so easy his burden is light don't live in the darkness come out of the night we're sons and we're daughters
of our Abide Bible Reading Plan. And guys, I haven't missed a day. (laughs) But you see what I mean? It can be so easy to be so focused on my faithfulness to Him. But guys, can I just tell you, like, our faithfulness to Him pales in comparison to His faithfulness to us. Right? Like, when we are unfaithful, He is still faithful. And it's that faithfulness that shapes everything about our lives. And so, church, as we begin the new year, can we one more time just praise Him and just say, great is his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. And church, it's so good to be gathered together today. As you grab a seat, will you turn to your left and your right? Give someone a fist bump. Tell them good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to say hello to everyone that's joining us online as well. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Stone. If I haven't met you before, I would love the opportunity to get to meet you, especially if it's your first time here. I would love to say, hey, I'm going to be hanging out in that area of the back of the auditorium. It's something called our living room. It's where the couches are and the chairs. So come stop by. Come say, hey, we'll love the opportunity to get to know you. And then if you want to get connected here around the bridge, it's pretty easy to do that. You can pull out your phone right now, and you can just go to the link that's on the screen, bridge.tv slash next. That's a great next step to take today. That'll give you a link to our digital connect card that you can fill out at any time. And of course, there's a physical option that's in the seat back in front of you that you can fill out and then drop in the offering bucket when it comes down your row here in just a few minutes. Um, But it is January 8th. It is our first in-person service of 2023. And with it we are kicking off our season of 21 days of prayer. And uh, I'm really excited about this season. I know our staff is really excited, but even more than that, I think we're coming into the season with just a a sense of expectation. We're all just sitting back like, man, I I wonder what God is going to do. And I I want to read you a quote. It's from a a guy named E.M. Bounds. Uh, The cool thing about him is he actually pastored a church up in Franklin in the late 1800s. And so he wrote 11 books, nine books on prayer. And uh, this is uh, just a sentence from one of those books. It says, prayer should not be regarded as a duty which must be performed, but rather as a privilege to be enjoyed, a rare delight that is always revealing some new beauty. I think all of us fall into one of three camps. Prayer is either distant from our life, it's a duty in our life, or it is the delight of our life. And if we're honest, my hunch is that maybe a lot of us fall in those first two camps. It's either distant from our life uh, or it's simply a duty that we perform. And our hope is that over these next 21 days, that for all of us, that prayer would, maybe for the first time, or maybe just again, become a delight in our life. And so that's 21 days of prayer. There's three components in 21 days of prayer. The first one kicks off tonight with a night of prayer and worship. Anyone excited about that? It's going to be a great night. It is tonight. It will be at 5 p.m. here in this building. We're really looking forward to it as both of our campuses come together, Columbia and Spring Hill, to worship here. By the way, anyone that's joining us online, if you're in the area, you're watching online this morning, get out of your room, get out of your dorm room, wherever you're at, come join us in person tonight at 5 p.m. It's going to be a great night. Uh, We've got child care available for uh, your little one's birth through pre-K and then any kids that are kindergarten and above. We're going to welcome them here in the auditorium so they get to worship together as our families. And so uh, really looking forward to tonight. The second thing we're doing is we have a prayer room. Uh, The prayer room is going to be open Monday through Saturday. So every day of the week, except for Sunday. And that's going to be during the 12 o'clock lunch hour. And so if you're around, that's 
this auditorium right here is gonna be a prayer room. We've got different worship leaders from even different churches in the area that are coming in and leading prayer worship sets. And it's just an opportunity for you to come in, bring your Bible, spend some time with the Lord, uh, just as we seek God together. And so come and join us Monday through Saturday, anytime, 12 p.m., come hang out. If you're not able to make it here in person, maybe just set an alarm on your phone, 12 p.m., because we'll all be pausing to pray together, to abide with Jesus and to be with him. And so really looking forward to that. And then finally, uh, we have a, a resource page online, bridge.tv slash 21 days. There's a couple things there. There's our, our Abide Bible Reading Plan. Uh, we'd love for you to join our church. I just uh, I saw just a couple days ago, there's already 2,000 of you that are subscribed to that through the YouVersion Bible app. And so uh, it's, yeah, it's just gonna be awesome as we go through the Bible together as a church. So there's that resource on that page, uh, as well as a form where you can submit prayer requests. So we'd love to pray for you this, uh, this season for 21 days, okay? Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys tonight as we kick it off, okay? Well, hey, we're about to dive into the teaching of God's word. Um, before we do, we always take a moment to give back to God. Our giving is a reflex to the generosity that we've already received. And so if you'd like to give, there's instructions on the screen as well as buckets that'll come down your row here in just a minute. Would you join me in prayer? God, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your generosity to us. Thank you that we get to be a part of that and then we get to give back to you. Use this for your glory and so that people would see what your love looks like in action. In your name, amen. family. My name is Rachel from our team here at The Bridge. And to everyone joining us in person or online, welcome home. We're so glad you're joining us today. And as we kick off a new year together, we hope you're ready to be a part of all God is doing here at The Bridge. We believe that everyone has a next step to take. So what's next for you? It's never a bad time to get connected and it's super easy to take that step here. One of the best ways for you to get connected to what God has in store for you here at The Bridge is by joining us for Open House. It's coming up next Sunday, January 15th. And whether you're wanting to get connected for the first time or just get a deeper glimpse into the DNA of our church, it's the perfect way to jump in. You'll get a chance to meet the team, meet others who call The Bridge home, ask any questions and take a step toward getting involved in what God is doing in our church. It's happening at both locations after services, and it's not too late to RSVP. Head on over to bridge.tv slash open house, and we'd love to save you a seat and see you there. Whether you've been local for a while or you're brand new and just settling into the area, there's one thing we all need to feel like we're part of a community. Here, we believe community is part of our calling, and that's why we have bridge groups. Bridge groups are a great way for you to build friendships, find encouragement and support, dive deeper into God's word, and take the next steps in your faith, whatever they may be. If that sounds like the next step for you, good news, our next group launch is coming up soon on February 5th, so mark your calendars. There's something for everyone, no matter where you're at in your walk with Jesus. In the meantime, if you're interested in leading or hosting a group, you can head over to bridge.tv slash groups, and we'd love to get you started. We can't wait to see all that God does in our bridge groups this next season. And speaking of community, we've got one more thing coming up even sooner that will get you connected. Ladies in the room, this one is for you. Coming up in just a few weeks, our women's gathering called Restored is happening and you don't want to miss it. Mark your calendars and get out your phones right now to go to bridge.tv slash restored so you can get registered to join us on Friday, February 3rd at 6.30 p.m. at our Spring Hill location. We'll have a night filled with worship, prayer, encouragement, and of course, deeper connections with one another. We can't wait to gather and we'd love to save you a seat. To all the kids joining us in person or online with your families today, we are so glad you're here. Parents, Bridge Kids is happening right now and it's one of the best environments for your kids to learn about Jesus in the way they best understand and have a ton of fun while they do. We also have a family lounge with a live stream of the service. So if you need to step out for any reason, you won't miss a single thing. On that note, we know God has something special in store for us in His Word today, so grab your Bibles and let's prepare our hearts to receive. Well, good morning, Bridge family. I know, I'm, I'm disappointed too, okay? I got the call last night at 7.37 that Ian was sick, and I think I was third or fourth on the list because nobody else could do it. 
So that's how desperate they were. And uh, so I get to be with you this morning, and I'm super grateful to be here with you. Thank you. You know, life is all about expectations. So if you just keep low expectations, this will go very well. This will go well. All right. Hey, if uh, I want to give a shout out to our Columbia campus, it's great to have you guys with us. And if you're watching online, thanks for joining us. You know, one of the things I love uh, about the bridge is this commitment to prayer. And this next 21 day of prayer is going to be awesome. But uh, Ian, before he preaches, always asks or invites us to, if we're comfortable, to just pray and come to the Lord with open hands. So if you're comfortable doing that, let's just take a minute and pray. Lord, this posture of openness to you reflects the desire of our heart to receive what you would have for us, both individually and collectively. Lord, we're grateful that you're here with us. We've been reminded over this Christmas season that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And I pray this morning that you would give us a fresh perspective of who you are, a renewed uh, filling of your spirit, and a greater clarity of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to go and take a survey and ask people to describe what God is like, no doubt you would get a variety of different responses. I believe that our perspective of God to a large extent, will determine the quality of our life. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he put it this way. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most important fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and during that time, I have met a lot of people who think that God, more than anything else, is just angry with them, that he's, he's standing in heaven, he's waiting for them to mess up so he can just throw a lightning bolt at them. And I'm here to tell you, if that's your perception of God, it's a distortion. That is not who God is. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at a portrait of God as our Heavenly Father that Jesus himself painted for us. It's in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. It's probably pretty familiar for most of you. It's called the prodigal son. So we're going to get started here in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country and squandered his wealth in wild living. That, that Greek word there for wild uh, means essentially uh, this kind of madness that knows no bound. It's kind of like you've completely lost it. There's no restraint. That's kind of where this, this kid is at. Now, in order to understand what Jesus is getting at in this parable, it'll be really helpful for us to have a bit of background on the culture of the Middle East during Jesus' time. First of all, a son's inheritance was never distributed until his father had died. So for the son to be demanding his inheritance at this point is essentially saying, I wish you were dead. This request... Uh, before the intended time would be considered one of the strongest forms of contempt and disrespect that a son could make. And the normal response of a Middle Eastern father would be to slap him across the faith and throw him out of the home. But of course, that's what an earthly Middle Eastern father might do. But here we begin to see that this father that Jesus is describing is no earthly father. Instead, he's representing, the father in this story is representing the very character and nature of God. Four times in this story, Jesus will give us a glimpse of God as our heavenly father. Now, throughout the gospels, Jesus refers to God as his father. But in this parable, Jesus actually describes for us what he is like. And here's where we get our first glimpse of God. Number one is that God as Father allows people 
to reject him. The God who created the universe, the all-powerful, the almighty God of creation, gives us the ability to reject him, gives us that free will. He won't violate anyone's freedom, even though he actually knows what's best for us. C.S. Lewis said, God cannot ravish. He can only woo. God won't manipulate or try to control us because he wants our love for him to come freely and without compulsion. Here's an interesting thing. God allows us to actually hurt him. What greater pain can there be than the, to be rejected by those whom you love? And in the midst of God's desire to have a, a free and authentic loving relationship with a person, he allows the freedom to slap his hand away because true love cannot be demanded. It must be given freely. And here we see this younger son's rejecting his father, in essence, slapping his hand uh, away, wishing he were dead, demanding his share of the estate. So what does the father do? Look at verses 12 and 13. He, divide, he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Now, I want you to notice that phrase, not long after that. There's some reason why he was in a hurry to turn his share of the estate into cash. Why the rush? Why wasn't he patient so that he could get the best price for his share? It's a good question. You know, one of the silent characters in this story is the community of people that this family lived in. And the son's haste must be understood in the context of what's going on and what would be going on in this community. I used to think that the prodigal son's family lived on this like huge plantation with this big white mansion and the, you know, the road kind of going up from the, the main street, uh, you know, kind of like something out of Gone with the Wind. But that wasn't the case. Instead, back then, most wealthy families wouldn't have had more than six acres, and their home would not have been actually on the land, but it would have been in a small town or village nearby. Now, this town would be tightly organized. The homes would be very close together, uh, some of them even stacked on top of each other like condos. Uh, there'd be a single road running through town, only wide enough for a fully loaded camel to pass. Typically, the more wealthy people would live in the center of town because it offered the most protection from attacks <coughs> uh, from uh, bandits or animals. Now, these were small towns. And you know what happens in small towns, right? Everybody knows everybody else's business. Typically, uh, these people would have heard everything that had already gone on. Everyone knows what happened. They would have found out how this son had treated his father, the contempt, the disrespect, and they would have been out of their minds with outrage over this. This is why the prodigal son has to get out of town fast. Kenneth Bailey was a theologian and an expert in Middle Eastern culture, uh, and he wrote a number of uh, books and commentaries on this, and he says this about this particular situation. He says, the town is outraged. This is demonstrated by the fact that the prodigal completes all transactions in not long after that. Someone in the community buys, but the rest of the community is horrified. The prodigal is selling his own soul and insulting his father publicly by making public what has happened between them. It's the hostility of the community that dictates his haste. So essentially, to minimize the consequences of the town people's outrage, he quickly turns his share of the estate into cash, most likely settling for far less than it was worth, and he sets off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth and wild living. But what he doesn't realize it has, he, is that he has taken the road to disaster. Look at verses 14 to 16. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 
This guy has hit rock bottom. A Jewish boy slopping pigs, wishing to eat what they were eating. I don't know if you can get any lower than that. I don't know how many of you have ever been in that kind of a situation, but I sure have. 37 years ago, I had completely blown up my life. I'd driven it off of a cliff. And one day I found myself sitting on a beach in Southern California where I was living, feeling devastated and utterly alone. After one too many bouts with alcohol and one too many immoral relationships, I was the prodigal son. I had squandered my life in this type of madness, living reckless and out of control. So this story is personal for me. This is my story. And there's some of you hearing my voice that this is your story too. And you may be tempted to think that God's love and forgiveness is for everybody else but you, that your sin is the exception. And I'm here to say that's a lie. That's a lie. The God who loves us wants to forgive and restore and replenish the years that the locusts have eaten. But I hadn't seen that. I kept numbing my emotional pain with alcohol instead of working through it and turning to false intimacy with women to fill this gaping hole in my heart. It's not a secret today looking back at how I came to this place. It was just one foolish decision after another, not taking responsibility for my own stuff. But I came to my senses in that moment there on the beach, but in a different way than the, we see in the prodigal son. Look at verses 17 to 20. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. See, the difference between where I was at sitting on the beach that day 37 years ago and where the prodigal is at right now is that I was broken by the consequences of my sin. I asked God to forgive me and to restore me. I surrendered my life once and for all on that day and heeded Jesus' invitation to come and to follow him. But the prodigal in our story, he's not there yet. He's not brokenhearted over his sin. Instead, he devises this plan to save face in the community by earning back the money that he has squandered. You know, a lot of people think that this little speech that he devises here in verses 18 and 19 is, is really uh, about contrition. It's motivated by sorrow that, that he's hurt his father. But I don't think so. Because look at verse 19. How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. This kid is suffering from an empty stomach, not a broken heart. He burns through his inheritance and wasteful living. He gets his first job slopping pigs, but that's a bust. He's not going to make any money doing that. He can't earn back all the money that he has lost. He can't even feed himself. If he had money in his pocket, he wouldn't even think about going back home. He's scheming here. At this point, I don't think he's remotely interested in forgiveness or reconciliation. He's just hungry. And he wants to find a way to get back into the good graces of his father in the community. Now, you might be wondering, well, Ken, how can you be so sure about this? Well, look again at verse 19. He says, I'm no worthy, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, that seems like we're moving in the right direction, but then look at this. Make me like one of your hired men. Make me? Really? Does that sound like a broken and contrite heart to you? It doesn't to me. But here's the plan. He's going to ask his father to pay for him to be trained in a local trade so that he can then be one of his father's hired servants. There were three types of servants in the first century wealthy Jewish home. The first was called a bondsman, and they were considered as actually part of the estate and, uh, and really a sense of the extended family. 
Then you'd have slaves of a lower class who actually worked underneath the bondsmen. And then there was this, uh, these contracted workers that were called hired servants. These were people that were skilled in different trades. It would be like if you were remodeling your home. You would go and find a, a contractor that would then find an electrician and a carpenter and you know, HVAC and all of those different things. That's exactly what's happening here. That's, in essence, who these hired servants were. So this kid was thinking, essentially, uh, I won't ask to be restored as my father's son. That's not going to work. Instead, I'll ask him to pay for my schooling in some trade so that then I can earn back all the money that I've lost. I'll just pay him back a little over time. And that's going to make everything okay. It seemed like the best, the best plan to resolve his problems. And he's got three problems as I see it. Problem number one is that he has sinned against his father. He has shamed the family publicly by demanding his share of the estate, therefore wishing his father dead, leaving his older brother, we'll come back to him in a minute, his older brother is now fully responsible for not only his dad, but the estate and everything else, all the servants and everything else. I mean, it's a Herculean effort here. And his father is now faced with incredible heartache and humiliation within the community. That's his first problem. Second problem is the older brother. Now that the estate has been divided up between them, all that is left is his. So if this kid comes home, guess who's responsible for him now? Financially, ultimately the older brother. That ain't going to go well. And then the third problem is the community. Remember, communities in Middle Eastern culture in Jesus' day almost functioned like an extended family. They were horrified by the insolence of this son. They wouldn't want him back, not to mention the fact that for a Jewish son to go and lose his inheritance to a group of Gentiles would probably be one of the worst things that he could possibly do. The community would demand that he be shunned, completely cut off. In every conceivable way, he would be considered as dead to them. And good riddance. So if this son tries to return to the community, he could expect unbelievable harassment, physical abuse, and maybe even death at the hands of the townspeople. But if he comes back as a hired servant and convinces them of his intent to pay everything back, he might be forgiven and restored back into the community. This whole plan was about self-atonement. It was about him fixing the mess himself. And it looked good on paper or parchment. The only wild card is his father. Would he agree to make him a hired servant? Would he agree to pay for his training in some trade? Would, would his father be able to secure him an apprentice position with another tradesman in the community? That was the thing he could not control. If his father refused, he was sunk. But if this plan did work, Ah, then he could literally earn his way back into the good graces of everyone, the father, his brother, and the community. So it was worth the risk. The only alternative was what? To starve to death. So he devises his plan in verse 20, and then it says he got up and he went to his father. And no doubt, as he's approaching the town, he's probably kind of psyching himself up for this reception, this vicious reception that he's going to receive. Maybe he's saying things like, okay, I can do this. Uh, a mob's going to form. Uh, they're going to, when they see me coming and they're going to probably run out and spit on me and call me names and taunt me and ridicule me as a failure. Uh, most likely they'll beat me with sticks or worse, uh, they'll stone me to death for the shame that I have brought to my family and to our community. It's risky, but what other choice do I have? At least if I die now, it'll be quick. I won't have to starve to death in some pig pen in a distant country. But as the town comes into view, nothing could prepare him for what happened next. Look at verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. 
Again, again, we got to understand this scene in this context of a, of a Middle Eastern culture. So let me just kind of break it down for you. The father sees his son while he's still far away. Was that an accident? Was the dad just kind of strolling that day and just happened to look up at the right moment and see his son? Kenneth Bailey answers our question. He says, the picture is not that of a father looking out through a window of a pillared mansion on the top of a hill who just happens to look up and see the approach of his long lost boy. Rather, we have the picture of a home in the middle of a traditional village facing a narrow street. The father for months or years has been watching the distant road as it approaches the town gate and becomes a vill the village street because he knows his son well and he knows he will fail. The father has been waiting, hoping, longing, praying, looking for the return of his son. And it's here that Jesus gives us this next glimpse of God that God as father is waiting for us to turn to him. God is not angry. The Bible tells us that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Friends, Jesus has made available to us a life of abundance. Being a Christian isn't just about praying a prayer and going to heaven when you die. That's awesome. And if that all there w was, that would certainly be enough. But there's so much more, right? It's like the Ginsu Knife commercial with for 1995, you don't get one set, you get two, right? I mean, it's just there's all this amazing stuff that the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in your heart. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he is beginning a process of conforming you and transforming your very character into that of Jesus Christ. The blessing of the Christian life is not health and wealth and prosperity as some might think. The blessing is Jesus. He's the blessing. There's so much more that God has for us if we will just turn to him. And the moment you do, you will see the very same thing the prodigal saw. You'll see the very same thing I saw 37 years ago. You will see the God of the universe run to you. This is the most amazing thing in the entire parable for me. Because a man of this kind of wealth and influence, this father, he would never run in public because it would require that he would kind of hike up his robe and show his bony little white legs with the sock tan line. That's the worst, right? He's not going to do that. It would be an act of disgrace for him to, to run. So why does he do it? Because he wanted to get to his son first before anyone in the community, before the mob could hurt him. It's like the father is saying to himself, there he is, there's my boy. He's come home at last. But I've got to get to him before the mob forms. I've got to protect him. And as the father is seen, just picture this in your mind, as the father is seen running through town, the people would be aghast. They would be looking in, in shock at the disgrace and the humiliation this father is bringing upon himself. They wouldn't even see the son. All eyes would be on the father. And that's exactly the point. This story, it's not about a prodigal son. This story is about the unconditional love of the father. That's the good news is that no matter what you've done, no matter where you find yourself today, no matter where you've been, there is love and forgiveness and acceptance a prayer away. And here Jesus paints in large brush strokes this third aspect of this portrait of the Heavenly Father, and that is God as Father demonstrates self-sacrificing, unconditional love. Listen, friends, he will go to any length. He will endure any form of public shame and humiliation, even if it means he hang naked on the cross on the outskirts of town. The father runs to the son and throws his arms around him and kisses him. 
He's showing everyone in the community, including the older brother, that all is forgiven. My son has come home. And don't miss the fact that it's the father who initiates all of this. It would have been customary for this boy to come home and fall at his father's feet and start kissing his feet and wiping them with his tears, that act of contrition and humility. But no, before he can do that, the father grabs him by the shoulders and hugs him and kisses him. And the word that that is used there is he kisses him over and over and over. He's just slobbering all over him. He just can't help himself. That's this lavish love that God has for all who would turn to him. And this demonstration of love, this amazing act of grace and public acceptance, it just wrecks this guy. It so totally takes him by surprise that he actually changes the speech that he prepared. Look what he says in verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice the part that he leaves out. He leaves out the part, make me. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know what, friends? <laughs> Nobody's worthy. I talk to people all the time to say, well, I'm not worthy of God's love, therefore I can't accept it. And the reality is, no, you're not worthy. Nobody's worthy. Are you kidding me? God's love for you is not about you. Surprise. It's about him. Why? Because God is love. 1 John 4, 1, John says, God is love. John could have used a lot of other adjectives to describe God. He could have said he was holy, he was righteous, he was just, he's omnipotent, he's all-knowing. And all of those would be true, but instead he says, God is love. The essence of God's character and nature is all summed up in that one word. God is love, and your sin is not the exception to his love. It's just not. Kenneth Bailey writes that the son is shattered by his father's demonstration of love in this humiliation. And he sees that the point, it's not the money, but it's the... It's the broken relationship that he can't heal. He can't fix that. And now he understands that any new relationship between he and his father is just a pure gift. He can offer no solution. To assume that he can compensate his father with his labor is an insult. I'm unworthy now is the only appropriate response. But the father... <laughs> He doesn't just welcome him home. He, he doesn't just demonstrate his, his love for him in, in receiving him and kissing him. No, he, he goes beyond. And this is where we get this final glimpse of God. God as Father is lavish in his love for us. Extravagant. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. See, the father wants everyone to know, including the household servants and the older son, that his lost boy has been found and is being, has been restored. He doesn't even have the son get cleaned up. Can you imagine what he would have smelled like? He goes and has his best robe, the one he uses for celebrations and parties, to be put on his son. He puts a signet ring on his finger, which is essentially the family's Platinum American Express card. And he puts sandals, and he, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? He puts sandals on his feet. Why? Because servants went barefoot, but sons had sandals. But the father's work of restoration is still not complete. He has one last thing to do. He must restore his son back to this community. Verse 23, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The reason the father doesn't have a, a sheep or a goat slaughtered is because that wouldn't have been enough food for the community. Instead, he has a calf which could have fed uh, at least 100 people. The purpose of the feast was to restore the son to the community. And now I think he gets it. 
This whole time, he's, he thinks it's about the money and about his father's reputation in the community. But that's not what his father wanted. Listen, friends, God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your time. He doesn't need anything. All God wants is you. That's all he wants. Because when he has our heart, he has everything. But are we willing to give that to him? Are we willing to trust in who he says he is? Will we stop looking at God through our own distorted lens of pain and confusion and the opinions of others and start looking at him as Jesus has painted for us? This kid finally realizes, I can't do anything to earn my father's forgiveness. I can't do anything to deserve being restored back into this family. And it's like, yeah, now you get it. And the same is true for us. That's exactly what God as our heavenly father does. You know, Lord willing, Ian will be back with us next weekend and he's gonna be starting a new series that is going to kind of unpack what it looks like to be formed in Christ, what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, what, it, what this abundant life that, that Jesus alludes to in John 10.10 10 really involves and entails. And there's so much more than just praying a prayer so that your sin is forgiven and then just trying to hold on by your fingernails, trying not to mess things up before you die so you can go to heaven. That is not the gospel. It's a part of the gospel, but it's not the whole gospel. The moment we give our lives to Christ, that is what needs to happen first. That is the moment we turn to him and we confess and we say, will you forgive me of my sin? And the Bible says when we confess that he is just and he will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no better way, friends, that I think we can start a new year than with a fresh perspective of who God is and embracing his true love for us. Let's pray. I'd actually like to pray over you uh, Paul's words from Ephesians 3. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Lord Jesus, would you give us the ability, the courage to actually embrace the truth about the Father and his love for us. Lord, that we can turn and he will run to us. It's a story that seems too good to be true, but we're gonna trust you in faith that this is who our Father is. And we thank you for that. And it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Wow, amen. Ken, thank you so much for opening the scriptures with us. I can't think of a better way to respond than by receiving to communion together as a church family and remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Remembering, yes, but communion is even so much more than remembering, it's participating in the body of Christ. The gospel is not just good news to hear, it's good news to live, it's good news to experience. And as we take the cup and as we take the bread, we experience again that love for us. And so in just a minute, our host team's gonna come forward and they're gonna pass out the elements. Make sure to grab both cups. There's the bread and the juice. They're in two separate cups stacked on top of each other. So grab both of them and then just hold on to them because we'll take it all together here in just a few minutes. If you would, will you stand with me? And let's worship.
remember on the night that he was betrayed he took the bread and broke it saying this bread is a symbol of my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me let's receive the bread and in the same way he took the cup and said this cup is a symbol of my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins each time you gather do this in remembrance of me let's receive the cup Let's just sing this one more time together as we celebrate who Jesus is.
Amen, church family, as we go. Well, Bridge family, it's been such a great morning and we are so glad that you tuned in. Before we go, I wanna encourage you to make the most of this time that we're gathering online and take a next step, whatever God is stirring in your heart right now. Yeah, we believe everyone has a next step to take and we would be honored to walk alongside you as you take that today. It's too important to wait. So make sure you fill out our digital connect card where you can let us know what God is doing in your life and leave a prayer request so we can be praying for you regularly. Mm -hmm. We're so thankful for the way technology has allowed us to do this together this morning. And we hope that Bridge Online is a resource for you in your growing walk with God or a step towards connecting to a local church family in person. You and I are both built for community. So I'd love to invite you to join us in one of our in-person services if you're in the Middle Tennessee area. Yeah, and even if you're not, we'd love to help you find a church family near you where you can continue your journey of being with Jesus and becoming like Him, all in the context of community. And last but not least, the mission of The Bridge and the life-changing ministry we get to do is fueled by your generosity. And it's helping us reach people with the gospel around our cities, nation, and all around the world. Giving is a part of our worship to God, and because He has given so much to us, it's an important opportunity to give back to Him and witness His faithfulness to the little or much we can give. If you'd like to give today, there are easy ways for you to take that step. And if you have already given, Thank you. We have one of the most generous churches and we're so honored to be on mission together. One last time, at least for today, I'm so glad you joined us this morning. We love you and God loves you so much more. May we all be with Jesus and become more like him for the sake of the world. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.